All right, thank you guys for joining us for another Guest Chefs at Google LAX. Uh, we're very excited to have Chef Dakota Weiss, and this is also gonna be our first Guest Chef event here at Google LAX that's branded under Zagat. So thanks for being a part of this. Today, Dakota of Top Chef fame and 9.30 in the backyard, as well as the W Hotel, but specifically 9.30 in the backyard from Westwood, is going to do a low calorie, low fat, three course meal for you guys that you can pull off in 20 minutes. Uh, well, possibly. <laughs> We're going to give you all the What's time you like. She's going to give you the basic steps right here. I just didn't want to put any pressure on you. Like <laughs> I was going to say, oh my God. Cool. Um, cool. Well, guys, thank you for coming and ladies. Um, so I prepared this low calorie, which is very not so much my nature. I'm really into the butter and the cream and the cheese. Um, however, we're in California, we're next to the beach. It's Google. I know everybody's very conscious these days about what they're eating, organic and fresh and light and stuff. So I created this for you all, just for you. Um, we're going to start with a raw vegan dish, which is uh, actually, uh, this is uh, probably squash carpaccio version 3.1. Um, I've taken this dish and kind of changed it throughout the seasons just to update it a little bit, but it is something that we do uh, serve at 930, but that's version 3.0, um, so don't get those confused. Uh, so basically, uh, we'll get started here. Um, we're going to take Akusa squash. Does anybody know what Akusa squash is? It's also known as the Mexican gray squash. It's uh, obviously kind of a cross between a yellow squash and a zucchini. Um, but this particular squash, and the reason I use this one is because it has less seeds and the meat inside of it has got almost a creamy texture to it. Um, so we're just going to slice the top off, shave it very thin, watch your fingers. If you don't have a man, does anybody cook at home? All right. Does everybody, anybody have a mandolin at home? It is one of the most fabulous tools I highly recommend you have. It slices just about anything, including your fingers, so please be careful. So we're just going to kind of line this down the plate. This really is technically like a five-minute dish, if even that. And it's really delicious and fresh. This, well, you know in California, everything's kind of in season year-round, um, but it's primarily summer. Yeah. We're going that thin. You can't quite read a newspaper through it, but it's still pretty, pretty paper thin. Um, so we're going to add on to this a yuzu soy white truffle vinaigrette. Uh, the most awesome thing about this vinaigrette is you don't need any equipment. You just need a cup and a lid. And it's what I like to call my shaker vinaigrette. Um, so we're going to start with a little yuzu uh, juice, which I'm pretty sure you can probably get at Whole Foods these days. If not, there's plenty of Asian markets around that you can get it. This is a little white soy sauce, rice vinegar, and then our white truffle oil. And you don't need to add any salt to this because the soy sauce adds enough of that. easy that was. <laughs> so we're going to season our squash here. I use a little bit of Maldon salt, which is a salt that comes from England, and it's these really beautiful crystals. When you come up, you can kind of see them. Um, we're going to add a little shaved serrano pepper to this to give it a little spice. Kind of sprinkle it around kind of like a Pollock design, I'd like to say. And then we're going to add some fresh sliced heirloom tomatoes. This dish is already screaming summer, right? <laughs> Don't you want to get in your bikini bathing suit right now? And I toasted earlier some fresh sunflower seeds, just give it a little crunch and texture. And then the dressing, be, you can be very liberal with it because it doesn't have a lot of oil um, and it's really packed with flavor. And you want to make sure that the squash gets completely doused in it. And 
And then lastly, we're just going to add some aromatic herbs to it. And you can be whatever you like if you've got something growing in your garden. I highly recommend those. But we're going to add a little bit of basil. And then a little bit of uh, micro bull's blood. All right, and that is your first course. Anybody want to try it? Yeah. All right, I'm going to come over here, and you guys can just kind of come up, bring me some forks. And just pick them right off there. Yeah, go for it. You'll see it's very light and refreshing. What do you think? You guys like it? Yeah. Surprising. That some, it, well, in my opinion, it's always surprising that something raw and vegan tastes so good just because I'm not a vegetarian, but by golly, it sure can. And you saw how easy it is to do. You just need a, you know, a mandolin. You can do it with a knife if you've got mad skills at home with a knife. Go for it. But yeah, it's so simple to make good food. <laughs> All right, so our second course, we are going to make uh, slow roasted arctic char. Um, does anybody know what arctic char is? Yeah. It's um, very similar to salmon and trout. Uh, it's kind of, I like to call it the sea trout. And uh, we're going to serve it with a lemon shiitake broth and some roasted spring vegetables. That's where you guys go, ooh. Ah, all right. I'll cue you. Next time it'll be this. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to start with our broth. So this starts to get uh, steeping in with the shiitakes and the lemon. Um, very simple. Some dried shiitakes. You can get these at any of the Asian markets off Sautel or the, the big one off Pico. I can never remember the name of that one. And then I like to take the lemons and zest them right into the shiitakes. Um, when you zest any citrus, I don't know if I can get this on camera, but it's pretty cool. It, it uh, kind of explodes with essential oils. And you can get it under light. When you twist it, you kind of have to be really close to it. You can see the oils kind of shoot off. And even more so, you can smell it. So what I'm trying to do with this broth is capture those oils into the broth. That's why I don't zest them ahead of time. No, it, it's not going to. The shiitakes are so powerful that you're not going to get any sort of bitterness from it. And then you can make this with water if you're a pescatarian. Uh, that's fine. Uh, but I choose to make it with the chicken stock to give it just a little more flavor. And then basically, you're just going to kind of let this steep for about 20 minutes. Once it's ready and it comes off, it's going to be a beautiful dark brown color. Can you, can you guys see that? <laughs> it's, 
It's got a really like nice golden brown mushroomy flavor to it as well, which you'll see. Um, so yeah, I'd let it like steep like this, 20 minutes, and then you can strain everything off. If you want to season it with a little bit of soy sauce to add a little salt to it, that's fine. If you want to go low sodium, just leave it as it is because all the other vegetables and the fish have a lot of flavor on them as well. Um, I try to not use too much because I really want to intensify and get the most flavor I can out of all the ingredients. It, dried shiitakes can be a little expensive, so, and, but they do pack a punch. So a little does go a long way. And then when you do strain it off, really kind of like press it, you know, try to get all the liquid and everything out of the shiitakes uh, once they're over. So that's going to go. Um, while this is on your stove boiling, you can get your fish ready. So Arctic char, like I said, is this really gorgeous um, pink fleshed fish, very similar to salmon, um, but I like to call it the sea trout. And it's got this really gorgeous skin with these little beautiful pink polka dots on it. I don't know about you, but I love polka dots, so that makes me love this fish even more. Uh, really simple, just season with salt and pepper. Both the skin and the flesh. Let your pan get pretty warm. Just put a little bit of olive oil in it, and then you're going to start it uh, skin side down. My little tester is usually to grab just a little bit of liquid, flick it in there if you hear that. You're good to go. Stand back. You don't want to burn your face. Uh, yeah. Okay. So once you have this in your pan, you're going to let the skin get super crispy going to take about two to three minutes. At that point, you're going to keep it on the skin, and you can pop it in the oven at about 325 and just slowly roast it. Um, but is everybody familiar with cooking fish and how it should feel, look? Um, my <laughs> What? <laughs> Why not? Uh, what I like to tell people, the easiest way or how I learned when you see the albumin start to come out of it, and that's like the little white, um, I don't uh, it looks like cheese curds, kind of, that's when you know your fish is starting to cook. Arctic char is one of those great fish where you don't need to cook it all the way. Um, I like to serve it medium, uh, but I do know people that like it completely well done as well, such as my mother. All right, we're hot now. So you can see... Once it starts to smoke, you know your skin's going to get crispy like that. Let's see if we can pick it up. See on the bottom? Well, that's a little burnt. We'll look at this one a little bit better. Nice, crispy, golden brown skin. <laughs> Never mind that one. That's why we always bring two pieces. Uh, so you're going to take this unburnt one and pop it in the oven about 230 degrees. You don't, or sorry, 330 uh, let it roast. When you start to see the little white albumin come out, then you know you're right about where you want it. You don't need to cook it all the way because we're going to add it into our warm broth. And as it sits in that broth, it's going to continue to carry over cooking as well. Um, for this, I think the vegetables, I, I used um, baby carrots, beets, and turnips, but I suggest... The best thing, because these are really beautiful right now and at the farmer's market, but the best thing to do is honestly just go to the farmer's market, see what vegetables they have. Um, you, it's better to cook seasonally, as we all know, and to buy your stuff from the market. Um, so what I did with these is I took the carrots, peeled them lightly, and just quickly blanched them. The baby turnip, same thing. See the cute little guys here. And then just quartered them. And then the beets are the only thing that I roasted in the skin, olive oil, salt, pepper, oven at 350 for roughly, if it's a, about that size, roughly 25 minutes. Same thing with the fish, is you don't want to cook the vegetables all the way through because you're going to put them in a hot broth, and that's going to continue to cook them as well. Plus, we all know you're going to retain more um, nutrition and all the vitamins from al dente vegetables as opposed to 
Wish you vegetables. Alright. This heat up a little. Any questions so far? So we have a little lull here. We're going to wait for our vegetables to heat. So hit me. <laughs> What's that? What about it? Um, well, you know, the, the cool thing about dried mushrooms in particular is it's very similar to canned vegetables, uh, tomatoes in particular. They, when they pick the mushrooms to dry them, they're at their best, you know, ripeness. They're like prime condition. They take them and they dehydrate them. So when you rehydrate them, they just, they're just perfect, more or less. Same with canned tomatoes. You know, everybody's like, oh, canned food is awful, but t tomatoes are really the only one that I would ever use this example with. But they pick them when they're just perfectly ripe. That's when they can them, and they're perfectly ripe no matter, you know, whatever you do with them. If you go to the store, you're going to get a mealy tomato no matter what, almost always, because it's not necessarily the season for them. Does that make sense? <laughs> um, what else you got? Come on, give me something. <laughs> yeah. I think, oh, I mean, everybody knows the Santa Monica Farmer's Market's probably the biggest and the best, I would say, in L.A. as far as um, diversity and all, and all the different purveyors and everything, where you can get soap, oil, beeswax, dates, and olives, you know, to, as, also to your proteins, cheese, and uh, vegetables. Um, a couple others that I really like, the Brentwood Market is fun, um, and plus it's right next to my hotel, so it's easy to get there. <laughs> uh, downtown's got some pretty cool ones coming up, too, especially on uh, Sundays. I believe there's one on 4th and Spring, 5th and Spring, I take that back. That's kind of a cool farmer's market as well. All-time favorite farmer's market in uh, California is San Luis Obispo. Is anybody familiar with that one? It's probably the coolest. It's every Thursday night. And they shut down uh, probably three blocks of one street. And each block has its own band. All the restaurants come out of their restaurant, set up these cool barbecues. It's just super festive. They've got food. They've got dancing. They've got gymnastics and comedians. It's pretty cool. I highly recommend it. Plus, Slow is just a really awesome town as well. Let's see how we're doing here. So these veggies you can prep ahead of time. Um, let's see. Sorry, it's very um, interesting. I'm trying to get it to get hotter. Let's get hot. I wish I had my inspector gadget tools with me today and just did that. All right, all right. These are going to take a little long or a little longer. Um, come on, give me some more questions. Anybody? Come the popcorn? Oh, that's a great question. I can answer that. Um, very simply, I take the popcorn and I air pop everything. Um, after that's done, I make a toffee. Um, so none of it is vegan, although I'm working on a vegan one right now as I was shamed at the artisanal market for not having one. <laughs> um, so it's in the process. Uh, make a toffee base. Whatever the flavor is, like the Napa Nirvana, I'll take like two gallons of red wine and reduce it down to two cups. Add that to the toffee. Then you take the popcorn and you mix it all up together. Um, then depending on what goes in it, whether it's rosemary or brie, that particular one, I take brie pieces and kind of spread it throughout the sheet tray. And then they bake in the oven for about an hour. Um, once they come out, toss them with the rest of the ingredients, rosemary, crackers, whatever it may be, and that's it. Well, we've had a test jar for about a year and a half just to kind of see how it would hold. And we opened it up about two months ago, and it was still pretty good and crispy. Yeah. I don't suggest holding it that long, but... <laughs> If you had, you put it in your emergency basement kit. <laughs> to get, what was the last part? Hmm. Well, any balsamic I like, obviously, I love the aged balsamics, but I'm really having this love affair right now with golden balsamics. Um, it's really sweet, but it's got a nice acidity to it. Uh, and you can pretty much, um, Bay Cities 
has a great selection and they've got a couple different golden balsamics there. But any aged balsamic in barrels, it's a way to go. Raw food recipes, I wouldn't really know where, I mean, obviously you can Google it. I'm sure of a hundred places. I can, <laughs> that's just like everyday language. Everybody knows that, right? Um, and I'm, I'm sure a hundred different uh, websites would open up for that. However, you've inspired me, and I will put some raw vegetable um, or dishes in general up on my website at chefdakota.com just for you in a week. Check back. It'll be there. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, it's, it's, you have to be really inventive and really creative to make raw food, in my opinion, taste really good. Um, you know, I mean, any, if you have a great product, it's going to taste great no matter what, but to make it interesting and just, you know, step outside of the normal kind of um, chopped salad raw thing, then it takes a little bit of creativity. There is a restaurant, um, I think it's called Salt Air, and they make a really good cashew nut cheese uh, there. Probably, I would assume, it's probably the same thought process. Yeah. All right, we are almost ready to plate here. So all this time has gone through. Our fish is beautifully cooked, right? <laughs> um, our, our sauce has steeped, and it tastes delicious. Our vegetables are roasted, um, and we're going to plate. It's very exciting. Everybody knows the state law now is to wear gloves pretty much for anything you do in the kitchen these days, even bartenders. So if you don't see your bartender wearing their gloves, you shame them. Um, well, I... I, I'm a glove person. I prefer them just because I go home and I have two dogs, and if I smell like food, I'll get mauled. Um, but I do know a lot of uh, chefs, sushi chefs in particular, are very upset about it because it does, it's not going to leave a very, you know, strong flavor. But when you're talking about raw fish that's very oily and, and it sucks up flavor, um, it, can, it can alter it a little bit. But for the overall health of everybody, it's probably just better and safe. <laughs> All right, so we're going to season our vegetables. Cool. Okay, so this is going to be our little sample bowl. So we've got our gorgeous broth, which... You're going to ladle that into the bowl. It's not necessarily a soup, so you don't want to do too much. But uh, once you know the fish goes in there and the vegetables, it's really going to soak up a lot of that liquid, and it's going to make it even more delicious. We have our beautiful cooked fish. You can put, you can be your own artist and put your vegetables however you like. If you're OCD, you can line up all the carrots all the beets, uh, and then we're going to finish this with a little bit of pea tendril because it's what's in season. You can just toss it with a little olive oil, a little salt, twirl it around. Right on top there. You probably can't see in there too good, but when you come up to try your sample, you will. All right, give me just one minute. You guys ready to try this? Awesome. Pea tendrils are the leaves of peas. Yeah. And they're, they're uh, a little more verdant, a little more grassy, um, but they're just as cute as they can be because they've got these little spiral vines on them that are just adorable. And you'll see them all over the market right now. Anybody have any qu other questions? For, for what? Harry's berries. It's all-time best berries I've ever had. 
really. And they're at the farmer's market uh, here in Santa Monica every Wednesday and Saturday. Um, I've never seen them in a store. Uh, so I'm not sure. I would say probably yes for now, but um, surely they've got to be somewhere else. But I, I you know, their, um, their farms are not far from here. They're Oxnard and Gaviota. So I imagine they're in stores probably more locally to where their farms are. Have you, have you guys had Harry's Berries? It is like just eating a strawberry. You know that like really intense fake strawberry flavor you get you know, out of candy sometimes? It tastes just like that. And it's so succulent and gorgeous and sweet and delicious. What's that? Yeah, you'll be like, this is not a Harry's Berry. I am not eating it. Does everybody eat fish in here? All right, so I could make a vegetarian one. Oh, you know what? I can make you some vegetables. I, forgot, I put chicken stock in the uh, broth. So that I hate to tell you it's vegetarian, it's not. My brief moment of forgetfulness. I'm just going to get a couple ready for you guys and start coming up. They're a little cumbersome to eat in these little cups, but you get the point. Everybody have to go back to work after this? Yeah. It's a nice break. <laughs> right? All right. You can start coming up here if you like and grab the ones with green and then fork right there. I'd say the liquid you could once you eat the fish and the carrots kind of do a little shot of it oh well I mean I think everybody's go-to is probably a, a, a seitan or a, a tofu um, yeah like mushrooms are always great I mean although there's no protein in there but to give you that kind of steaky texture those are always a go-to as well especially portobello's porcini's are great Okay, so for dessert in our very healthy, light, low-calorie um, meal, we're going to make a homemade almond milk yogurt. Has anybody made yogurt before? Very fun. Uh, anytime I get the chance to ferment anything, I get super excited. Um, and it's actually, I was a little intimidated at first to make yogurt, um, but just because it's a little kind of a scary process, leaving stuff out and hoping it magically comes from, you know, milk to this, like, beautiful cream. Um, but it's, if I can make it, I got to say anybody can make it because I'm not much of a baker. Not that you have to be a baker to make yogurt, but you have to be very precise in your measurements and stuff. So, okay. So the first step to this is to make your almond milk. You're totally welcome to just buy almond milk 
and there's some great places that actually make it artisanally here in Los Angeles as well. But it's so simple to make, and I feel like if you're going to go through the hassle of making your own yogurt, you might as well just make the almond milk from scratch. Um, it is just that easy. Uh, the ratio for almond milk is usually three to one. Uh, one being the almonds and three being the water. Uh, for yogurt, though, I take it actually down to two to one, just so you're going to get a more intense almond flavor, and it'll help make the yogurt a little bit thicker as well. It helps if you have a really awesome blender as well. If you don't, um, you can buy, they're called a nut milk bag. And it's kind of basically like this really cool sieve. And once you puree this, you would pour it into this bag and you literally just squeeze out all the liquid from the milk and it keeps all the pulp. If you have a badass blender like this, then I say just leave the pulp in there because it's going to puree it enough where it doesn't leave any weird fibery textures. And plus it's going to add a little more flavor as well. No, the almonds can be whole. I just happen to have slivered. Um, you can toast them if you want a toastier flavor to it, or you can just leave them raw. It's completely up to you on how much you would like your almond milk to taste like almonds. I've not, but I imagine you can probably I mean, make milk out of any nut as far as I'm concerned. All right. How easy that was? You have almond milk. Awesome. So you're going to take that, you're going to strain it, or you're just going to leave it as it is. Um, I do those bowls. Give me one second. You're going to take this almond milk. There's two ways you can make yogurt. You can buy a culture starter, um, which is kind of like a powdery um, substance. If you want to keep it completely vegan, then go with the powdery substance. If you don't care if it's vegan or not, you can take any yogurt, your favorite yogurt, as long as it has active cultures inside of it. Um, and you, you just simply add it to your milk. I use clover yogurt. It's um, local to California, and they're just a really good farm. You just want to lightly kind of stir it in there because you don't want to upset any of those cultures that are in there because they're very sensitive, not unlike meat sometimes. Just give it a little stir. You're going to cover it up. You're going to find a place somewhere in your house or wherever you choose to make this that's around 90 degrees. If you don't have a place that's that hot, my little um, MacGyver rig is you can, if you have a heating pad, or you can go to Target and buy a heating pad. Take that heating pad, put it in a corner in your uh, kitchen, wrap this with just a light towel around it, and let it sit there for eight hours. Forget about it. Don't even look at it. It's like watching a, boil, a boiling pot of water, right? Um, after eight hours, you're going to refrigerate it for about four hours without opening it or messing with it. After four hours, you're going to get this beautiful looking substance, <laughs> right? Don't be scared. Um, what you're going to do with this part is basically cheesecloth into another container. If you have really cool like mason jars, like I have the popcorn, they make really awesome little jars and they're cute to put them in. And you'll see, it's kind of hard to see, but you can kind of see the floating fermented part where it's all coagulated. Awesome. And if you smell it, it smells amazing just like yogurt and this is going to separate the liquid from the curds these are more yeah this was this is big kitchen batch this is little home batch <laughs> unless you like a lot of yogurt then by all means go get big kitchen batch <laughs> so once this completely strains you're going to get this cool-looking stuff. 
Um, and this is your yogurt. It's gorgeous. It's going to look a little curdled. Um, don't be alarmed by that. It's totally normal. Uh, let's see if I have a bowl. I can put that in. But it gets this just really amazing texture. You can kind of see it's, it's pretty thick. The more you let it sit, the thicker it's going to get. And at this point, it's completely ready to go. There's no sweetener in this. Even though almond milk tends to be a little sweet, once it goes through the fermentation process, it adds that sourness to it. So if you like, you can add sugar, raisins, honey, maple syrup, whatever it is that you like. So, for our purposes, we're turning this into a dessert. And we're just going to take this beautiful yogurt and layer it with some berries. These are not Harry's berries for today. <laughs> If the market was open, I may have been productive enough to go get some, but um, not today. Then for uh, this, I wanted to add a little bit of a tropical note to it, so I brought some passion fruit. Has anybody seen passion fruit before? It looks really kind of boring and almost like a rock until... You open it and you get this gorgeous pinky orange beautifulness. So we're just going to scrape a little bit of passion fruit seeds on there. Yep. It'll only scrape so much. The seeds are really going to be the only thing. This white stuff in there won't really come off unless you're super aggressive with it. There. And then we're just going to finish this off with a little bit of almond brittle just to make it more desserty, And also to give it like another fun, crunchy texture. And that is your healthy dessert. Ooh, all right, here we go. All right, who wants to try this? Me, yeah. conveniently have them done for you. So does this seem easy enough? Do you feel confident you could go home and make it? Absolutely. That's the right answer. And then if you want the recipes for all of this, they will be uploaded on my website later this evening. Oh, my Lord. That is a loaded question. Um, I'm going to have to go with uh, probably the simpler things, such as like beef bourguignon. I really like the comforty braised meats that, you know, you really put a lot of time into. Um, yeah, I would say that. And plus, it's classic, and I love those classic dishes. And it reminds me of my grandma. <laughs> Underrated? Well, about six months ago, I probably would have said kale, but now you can't get away from kale. It's pretty much everywhere. Um, I have to say just a lot of the random bitter greens, like tot soy, you know, Lola Rosa, frise. Um, I think people, usually when you get a, you know, a mescaline salad and you see all the crazy lettuce in there, people are like, I don't want these weeds. Why are they feeding me weeds? Those weeds taste really delicious. And I don't think they're utilized a lot. What's that? Do I eat Cajun foods? Um, not too much. However, I did used to uh, work at the Ritz-Carlton in Sarasota. And my restaurant there was based, because it was on the Gulf, we based it on all the different areas of the Gulf Sea. And, um, so I did have some Cajun stuff, and I made a really good jambalaya risotto. 
um, which basically you just make a base risotto and then add the ingredients of a jambalaya to that. We did uh, the shrimp braised in molasses. Um, so that's probably the extent of my Cajun cooking, but I do love to eat it. <laughs> the, the andouille sausage, absolutely. You can't have Cajun food without that. <laughs> Probably not very uh, traditional to what it should be. All right, go ahead and uh, grab a spoon and a parfait. You can see in this, once you get into there, the bits and pieces of the almond, too. Uh, yeah, we'll put it on my website, chefdakota.com. Um, as soon as we get home. <laughs> is there dressing on those? Oh, is that? Okay. Kind of hard to get everything on those little spoons, but it kind of serves the point. <laughs> so, any last questions on anything? You can, actually, with it. With, um, I've not made it, but uh, the class that I took to make yogurt, they made it from coconut milk. Uh, sorry, coconut, yeah, coconut milk. Um, they did something else really outrageous. I was like, oh, my God. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a nut, though, but it was, yeah, it's really fun. I think just as long as you've got the temperatures right and you let it sit long enough and you don't peek or poke at it, it's, it's, it's going to happen. Science. It's awesome. <laughs> Anything else? You guys like it? Good? All right. Well, thank you so much for coming in. I appreciate it. I, I don't. Uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, we didn't bring any. We just brought a few jars, but you can always get some at chefdakota.com. <laughs> just click on Pop Parlor. So thanks again. I appreciate it.